Welcome everyone, my, my name is Jim Hatcher. I work for Datastax. Uh, I'm a solution architect, which means I you know, work with clients so that they, you know, they buy our software and wanna, wanna do something with it, I help them. So um, I want to talk today about running Apache Cassandra on Docker. And um, so there we go. Uh, quick, quick agenda, I'm, I'm gonna talk about Cassandra and I'm, I'm not gonna talk about all the details of what Cassandra is, but I want to talk about some of the implications of Cassandra that kind of make it interesting uh, to run in a virtualized environment or a containerized environment. And then I want to talk about Docker, just kind of give you an intro to what Docker is. Uh, I won't spend too much time there because there's been a couple talks about it today, so maybe you've already heard some of that. But And then I'm going to do a demo, which might crash and burn, but uh, hopefully the internet will stay up and we'll be able to do that. And um, and then we'll talk about, you know, you know, based on what we what we know, do we think that using Cassandra and Docker together is a good match? So, um, I'll mention I work for Datastax, and there are some uh, Datastax images in Docker, but I chose to do this presentation using pure Apache uh, Cassandra, and so, but a, a lot of the, you know, the, the the takeaways from this talk, you know, would apply to both. So. Um, all right, so what is Cassandra? What is this magical unicorn database that we all love? Um, uh, I, I guess so the, the parts I want to focus on for this talk are, you know, what are the things that you can do in Cassandra that, that are very different than what you could do in a relational database like Oracle or something? So to, to me, the, the two capabilities of Cassandra that, that really stand out are the fact that it's, it's, a, it's made to be distributed across uh, many servers, and so that, that scale out Scale out ability uh, has some really neat implications. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we scale out a Cassandra cluster is just for pure data size. So, if you've got a cluster that's holding 10 terabytes of data and you need it to hold 20, well, you can double the size of your cluster and it'll handle that. And uh, so, the you know the scale ceiling that we sometimes hit in relational databases, you know, Cassandra is a good option for that. So sometimes we scale out to hit data size, but some, sometimes we scale out um, because we need to hit higher throughput numbers or high concurrency numbers, but it has a lot of neat, neat capabilities around the way that it scales out or the way that it scales in if you, you know, kind of need to go the other way. And uh, another one of the, the great, great capabilities of Cassandra is the, the idea that, hey, I've got a data center in Europe and I've got a data center in North America and I've got a data center in Asia and I want to have applications writing to those data centers, but I want that data to replicate all over the world. Uh, it's very difficult to do in a relational database, but it's just built into the DNA of Cassandra. And so these are these are the reasons we, we love Cassandra. These are the, the things that it solves for us, or at least in my mind, these are two of the two of the big ones why it's a why it's a great choice. Um, so uh, so but one of, one of the one of the things about relational or Cassandra that's a little different than relational is that it's a very I/O intensive database. So you know we think about the typical read and write path. You know we know that Cassandra is very fast for writes because it, it appends data. It's an append only structure, and the read path's very fast because we do lookups by by keys. Uh, but there's a lot of you know to, to make that read path and write path very fast, we do a lot of stuff in the background. And uh, so I just, you know, we, we, we talk about uh, the impacts of compaction. So, you know, as, as we're writing data into Cassandra, you know, we're creating these SS tables, they're getting flushed, and this compaction is uh, happening in the background to make sure that we, we, we have a reasonable, manageable amount of tables. So that's a very I.O. intensive process. We also have repair going in the background. Um, and that's constantly going out there and building Merkle trees and passing data around and streaming. Um, you know, mismatched data, and then uh, any, any type of operation that, that involves streaming, whether you're bootstrapping a node or uh, rebuilding a node, you know, that, that, that streaming causes a lot of uh, I.O. So, um, you know, uh, so, so lots of I.O. And so, uh, best practices for Cassandra that, you know, this is kind of a list of things that's often a little uh, paradigm shattering if you come from the relational database world. Uh, you know, one of the things we say about running Apache Cassandra is that we don't want to use shared storage. We don't want to use that expensive SAN you've got. We don't want to use that NAS you've got. Uh, you know, we want locally attached storage on each node, uh, preferably SSD. Um, and so that's, a, that's kind of a mind shift for a lot of people when they come from the relational, uh, relational world. 
Um, you know, the idea that, well, what if, what if a disk goes out, you know? Um, well, in, in, you know, in the Cassandra world, if a disk goes out, then you, the server's out, and you need to go back and replace that server, and there's mechanisms to handle that. So, um, you know, we, we, we don't, you know, we, we typically like to run on locally attached storage, and uh, we, we do things like we, we disable swap because we don't, we don't, you know, if, you, if you're having disk issues or something, we just want to take that server down and fix it and get it, get it back, so. And then uh, typically we, we don't recommend running on virtual, virtualized environments like uh, you know, VMware or something like that where there's a hypervisor because there's just some overhead involved that we don't necessarily uh, need. So, um, but in, in terms of the cardinal sin, that, you know, don't use shared, shared storage, that's a big one. If, if you're gonna use virtualization, that's, that's kind of a no-no, but we, that one's less, that, that one's not so bad. Um, but anyway, so you know, these are some implications of Cassandra that I think are interesting to think about when we're looking at, you know, do we want to run, run in a containerized environment? So, um, so one, um, just want to talk about, well, wait a minute, if you're telling me we don't want to run Cassandra on shared storage and we don't want to run it in a virtual environment, what about the cloud? Isn't the cloud typically shared storage and, and uh, virtualized environments? And the answer is yes, you're, you're right. Uh, and Cassandra runs very well in the cloud. So I, I think it's interesting to look at a couple, couple points here. So you know, if, you, if you're running in, in AWS uh, and you're running a Cassandra, you can have the option, do I want to run uh, uh, instances and put my data on uh, EBS volumes? Or do I want to run like on some of the newer instance types that have locally attached NVMe um, mounts, and, which are, but they're ephemeral. And so, you know, we, we, we see people doing both. So that if, if you go the EBS route, you're using shared storage. And if Amazon EBS goes down, well, you're, you know, that's a single point of failure and your, your cluster is going down, you know? Uh, so, that, you know, and so there's a little bit of performance hit, but in some ways it's nice because you can say, I'm gonna take this node down, I'm gonna bring it up somewhere else, I'm gonna reattach that, that EBS mount, and, you know, I still have my data. Um, so on the, on the other end of the spectrum, you can run on ephemeral, an ephemeral SSD, uh, which you get a lot of performance for that, but you have to be careful, because if you stop that node, stop that instance and bring it back up, your, your data's gone. So, you know, I think when people first hear that, they, that that's a little scary for them, like, I, what do you mean I, I could stop my node and my data's gone? That's, that's, not a good, that's not a good way to operate. But it's really not that different than how we operate on bare metal. We say, hey, you're going to have this nine node cluster, and if this one server goes down, uh, you know, because the motherboard fries or whatever, um, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're basically going to bring that node back online and we're going to rebuild it from the other nodes anyway. You know? so, so in some ways, it's really not that different than how we run on bare metal. So it's kind of a comfort, comfort level thing there of saying, Hey, I can I can really get the benefit of using the performance of, uh, of you know locally attached SSD, but you know I need, need to kind of be careful. So I, th I think some of the lessons we've learned in, in running in the cloud can kind of be interesting in, in this world of running a container. So um, so I left out some tips here about you know if you're going to run uh, you know using ephemeral ephemeral disk, you know what what are what are some ways you want to go about that. So. Uh, one one thing, you, one lesson there is like you you know have, know how to do you know uh, backups and restores and, and test that, um, and then uh, know how long it takes to bootstrap a node or to re replace a node. Uh, you know if, if if you have a node go down and you need to totally rebuild it from other other nodes in the cluster or from another data center, uh, you really ought to have a sense of is that going to take me eight hours to rebuild or is that going to take me four days to rebuild, and. Um, you know, so you, you really need to do some failure testing around that to say, okay, I'm going to wipe this node and rebuild it. Um, and if you find that, man, it's taking me two, two days to, re, to, re, to rebuild a node because of the streaming, you, you, you may need to reduce your node densities on your, on your, on your cluster to get that down to a, a reasonable time. Um, and then, you know, there's just some cloud-specific stuff, like if you set up availability zones properly and Amazon goes through and, and does maintenance on all of its stuff in US East, and all your nodes go down unexpectedly. Um, you know, if you've aligned Cassandra to, to, to have racks that, that go to that uh, availability zone, you know, you're, you'll be in much better shape. Um, anyway, so some, some more tips there. But um, so those are the things about Cassandra that I think are interesting. And then uh, Docker. Um, 
I think most folks are kind of generally aware about Docker, but um, you know, conceptually, Docker is similar to like a virtual machine or a, you know virtualization, but uh, in, instead of being VMs, Docker uses containers, and a con container is a little bit like a lightweight uh, VM. Um, there's a there's a YouTube video go where a guy kind of uses the analogy of um, a VM is a house and Docker is an apartment. They they both kind of give you isolation from the outside world, um, but you know the house has some probably some overhead that maybe you don't need if you're a single guy and you just need a one bedroom apartment or something. You know, but um, anyway. So, um, but but the building blocks of uh, containers are a technology called namespaces, which gives you like price, process isolation. Uh, so if you know if you're running two two Docker containers on a node and you type ps at the Linux command line, you're not going to see the processes run on that other container. You know, it's all it's all namespace to that one instance. Uh, and then control groups is is a mechanism that that limits uh, you know CPU memory, and so the, the, and then you know there, there's like UnionFS I think is what's what's used by default. So um, these are kind of the building blocks of containers, um, and then you guys have probably seen um, you know diagrams like this, you know just to kind of you know reiterate the point that that containers are like lighter weight VMs. You you, you still have you know several processes running inside one one physical host, but uh, in the VM world, you, you also have kind of the overhead of an o, the guest OS, whereas in the container container world, things are just a little lighter weight. So, you know, I think uh, containers have really become popular in the last I don't know a uh, few years, uh, due, due due in part to to the rise of microservices. And the idea that we, we want to be able to take you know our, our big monolithic API layers or service layers, we want to break them down into lots of little pieces. And how can I run those pieces in in uh, lots of discrete uh, ways? And so they they work really well on stateless services like you know web web servers and app servers. Um, and but there's it's a little bit of a different story when we get into stateful services. So that's what we're talking about today. Um, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to do a little demo here. All right, so I, I spun up a uh, uh, a node in Azure, and I'm gonna connect to it here. You guys see that? Let me make that bigger. You guys see that in the back? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so so this is a just a, a, a Ubuntu instance. It's running Ubuntu 18. And it's got really nothing on it right now. I just launched it in Azure. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, it's got 16 uh, cores and about 64 gigs of memory. So what I want to do, the first thing I want to do is I want to get um, a Docker installed on this, this host machine. So I'm going to, this is Ubuntu, so I'm going to do that through uh, apt. And um, so I'll, I'll uh, these are some commands that I, I just I just Googled set up a, a Docker on Ubuntu 18, and uh, these are the commands that I found. So I'm just going to use uh, apt-get to pull down some of the some of the Docker libraries. I won't explain this too much, but we'll get this stuff going. Okay. All right, so here's the, the main step where we're, we're telling uh, Ubuntu that we want to install Docker CE. Uh, get to this. Upgraded. Oh, I think I'm on the wrong VM. Sorry about that. I don't think I have Docker. Yeah, okay, I don't have Docker installed here. Sorry. I had Docker on that other one.
Okay. Alright, here's the step where we're actually pulling down the Docker uh, application. Finish. Okay. And we're going to tell Docker to run as a service. And then we're going to add ourselves to the Docker group. And then make sure that we're. We've got Docker. Okay, so I'm going to run Docker info here. And. Um, Okay, so yeah, so we, we're, we're on a machine here with 16, 16 CPUs, 63 gigs of memory. Okay, so now we've got, we've got, um, we got Docker installed on our host machine. All right, so, so the next thing we wanna do is we wanna pull down uh, a Cassandra image. And so an image in Docker is basically all the dependencies that are um, uh, built around you know, providing certain functionality. So you can actually uh, search, um, like you could say Docker search Cassandra and see, see all the, the things that on like Docker Hub that, that match that. So uh, this Cassandra one is like the official one, but there's other ones here, Bitnami and The Last Pickle and others. Um, but, but what I want to do here is just pull the Cassandra um, image. So if I do that. What you'll notice is it's, it's pulling several images, and these images are like layers. So if I were to install some other container, uh, it, it might have some of the same images in its dependency tree, and it, it doesn't have to, to reestablish them. So, uh, But to, to pull down the Cassandra image, it's, it's really not that much data. It didn't take that, that long. Um, when, when I say Docker pull Cassandra, it just pulls the latest, which is, uh, in this case, Cassandra well, I, I think you could, from this image you can run Cassandra 3.11 or Cassandra 3.0 or Cassandra 2.2. Um, and then uh, we can run this command to see what, what images are installed in this container. So uh, we have the Cassandra uh, latest. And then uh, I'm going to run a couple commands here to, to create some directories on this uh, machine. Uh, let me do them one at a time, I guess. So I'm going to create uh, a directory here, var lib container data, and then Cassandra nodes one through six. And I'll explain why I'm doing that in a second. OK, I already got six. All right. All right, so we, we've got Docker running on our host machine, and now we've pulled down the Cassandra image. And then what we need to do is we need to actually run one of these images. And so uh, this is the basic syntax. Um, we say Docker run. We give uh, a name to what, for, to what this uh, instance is going to be called. Uh, this D option tells it to, to go ahead and kick off the, um, the container in the background, start, start it up. And then all these dash E options, uh, I'm, I'm specifying environment variables. So in this Cassandra image, uh, these various variables are uh, exposed to me. So I can say, I'll, you know, uh, when I spin up this thing, it's going to join this cluster. It's going to have this number, number of tokens, this kind of thing. So um, I'm going to have these, these machines be in uh, DC1. I'm going to have some of them in Rack 1, some in Rack 2, some in Rack 3. Um, and then th this option, I'm telling it, uh, when I create that instance, uh, I'm a, I want to use a, a directory on the, on the host machine, and I want to map it to a directory on the container. And that's like, that gives me transparency of the data back at the host machine layer. And then I have to tell it what, what image to use. So let me just demo this real quick. I'm going to spin up my, f my first node. likes my uh, copy and pasting. Uh, I had to 
did this differently earlier. That's what I get for demoing. You have got backsliders in there which shouldn't be pasted onto the terminal because of the, the spaces are being escaped and being treated as part of the command. So either you should remove those backsliders or copy paste them and delete their lines. Okay. We'll try it. Um, yeah, earlier I was pasting them in. Uh, yeah, something's going on. I mean, in the presentation as well, when you copy pasted those lines, the new lines were going missing. Yeah. So those commands they were there, you know, they're going missing. Yeah, I, I was using a. a let's see how this goes. Um, okay, so so what I've done here is created uh, one one node, and um, thank you for that. Um, and now, um, so I can run a command uh, docker, I can say I want to exec. Uh, dash IT says I want to make it an interactive. And then I can say Cassandra node one, and I can run bash. I think, I think that's right. Uh, okay, so now I've, I, I'm inside of the container, and I can run like a node tool status here. And I can see that my container, my, my cluster has a, a one node in the in the DC one data center, in rack one, and it contains all of the data with eight tokens. So uh, I can get back out. <coughs> so so the second command, it, it's almost identical to the first one, except I, instead of saying Cassandra node one, I'm going to say Cassandra node two here. And then I'm going to supply the IP address of the first node as, as the seeds for the second node, so it'll know to, to connect to that one. Uh, uh, probably have the same problem here. OK. Well, you know what? I've got them over here. So this is the second node. Um, we'll give that one a second to uh, bootstrap. And then here's the third node. Um, and we'll let that go. OK. Now I should be able to run Docker container, uh, get a list of uh, containers that are running. And so I have three, three containers running, uh, Cassandra node one, Cassandra node two, and three. And if I go back into Cassandra node one and do a node tool status now, we should see that these other, well here the, we can see this, the first guy's up in normal, second guy's up in joining. Now he's normal. And uh, we don't have the third guy yet. Let's give him a minute. Okay, so I think I added him too quickly. So what I can do is I can say uh, docker logs, uh, Cassandra node 03, and it tells me, yeah, uh, okay, we, get, we got an exception here. Uh, other bootstrapping nodes were detected, can I bootstrap? Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's stop him, three, and then let's start him back up. Let's go back in and see if we can see him bootstrapping. So, um, so I want to talk about the fact that that I, I mounted uh, the the data points of these of these different uh, containers to the to the host. And one interesting, one interesting thing that lets me do is that if I needed to like wipe out one of these containers and like bring it back later. I do have the data actually stored in the local host so I can get to it. Um, you, don't, you don't have to set it up that way. You could say, hey, I'm going to let the data live on that container, and it just lives there. And that's kind of more like the, the ephemeral you know, AWS kind of method where if I lose my container, you know, when it comes back up, it's going to reboot strap, or I could, I could do like a replace operation, and it's just going to get its data from the other nodes in the cluster. Um, you know, by, by mounting it to the host machine, I, I could say, okay, bring this node back up, don't auto bootstrap, let it find its data that's sitting on the host machine. Uh, of course, if I lost the host machine, then, you know, same, same kind of situation exists there, but let's see how we're looking here. Okay, 
we got our we, we got our three node cluster up. We got a node sitting in rack one, rack two, rack three. Um, let's see how I'm doing. Um, okay, so just to kind of demonstrate that, I'm going to bring up uh, SQL shell, and um, let's create a key space called test, and uh, make this network topology strategy. Uh, this is DC one. Whoops. So we have a, a test key space that's going to replicate uh, three times across our DC. So I got and I got three nodes, so I should have data on one node one, two, and three. Um, now let's use test key space and let's create a table uh, called user with a user ID. That's going to be our primary primary key, first name, last name. Okay, and then let's insert some data into this guy. Okay, now we should be able to query our data. And there it is. Okay, so we got a basic key space set up. We got a table, we inserted one record in there. Now, if we come back out to um, node one here and do a flush, we're, we're telling Cassandra, take any data that's written into memory and flush it to disk. Um, and then if I exit out of this container and go back to the host machine, I should be able to go to um, where, that, where that data lives. And um, there's our, our test key space. So I'll change to the test. And then we have a user table in there. And then uh, we can see that we have an SS table written. And, um, and that's back on, we have access to that in our host machine. So if I were to shut down that container at that point, um, you know, I, I still have access to the data. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing you can do. Um, so I hope that kind of gives you a sense of uh, how it can interact with these things. Um, you know, some other things you can do when, when you're spinning up, uh, go back to my presentation. Um, when you're running this Docker run step, um, is that, um, you know, I'm specifying uh, some environment variables, I'm specifying a volume. You can also specify ports. You can say, okay, there's, there's some process that's running inside of the container that I want to expose back on the host machine. So if there's some like website running, something like Prometheus or OpCenter or, or that kind of thing, you can say, I want to expose that thing to my host machine. So that's really helpful like when I'm running Docker on my, on my Mac. I just want to have an instance, you know, like an instance of something running, and uh, maybe it's running OpCenter, which is a monitoring tool used in DataStacks Enterprise. Uh, I just want to expose that, uh, you know, to, to my um, to my Mac, so I can go up to a browser and say I want to get to that OpCenter and go through to it. Uh, so that's one of the things you can do there. Other other options you can specify here is you can give it some uh, resource constraints. You could say, hey, I'm going to create these three containers on this machine, and uh, the containers really can't. Uh, I don't want this container to exceed more than two CPU, you know, at, at any given point in time. So you can you kind of leverage some of the C group stuff, uh, and, and really kind of lock down the resources. So there's some things you can do. So you know, do we have a match? Um, you know, I think my take on it is that it's it's a really neat option for uh, for dev test uh, training. You know, if I have some little scenario I want to test. Let me spin up a three node uh, cluster you know, run a stress test tool against it or something and play with some settings, shut it down. And that's really great for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I, uh, in terms of running something in production, I have to say I've never tried it. I've never worked with a, a, a customer who was like, you know, raring to go, ready to try it. But I, I think these are some of the questions that I, that I, would, that I would think about. And, um, you know, one question that comes to mind is the, the safety factor. You, you know, I think one one of the reasons people, you know, are looking at this kind of containerization thing, or or, or virtualization, is that you know you got you got a machine, you got this big fat physical host with 32 cores on it and 256, 256 megs of RAM, and and you know you want to you want to put a bunch of virtual machines on there, and you kind of over over provision resources. You know, 
because at any given point in time, not all of those servers are going to be using things at once. So you can do that same kind of thing in a, in a container, container, containerized uh, environment. You can say, I've got 32 CPUs, and I'm going to let uh, you know, all these containers, you know, I'm going to have eight containers there, and I'm not going to restrict how much CPU they can use. Um, and that, you know, that's one of the advantages. You, you, know, you can get better efficiency, better use of your, of your investment in hardware. But you know, there's a there's this trade-off. I think um, you know if you if you way over provision your stuff, and you know you get an out of memory area and you're and you're you know you're you're, you're ooming everywhere. That's that's not good. But in the, the, if you go too far the other way and you don't give it any safety factor, what, why are you running in containers? You know. So I think you, you, you know you need, for your use case for your the profile of your application, I think you need to find that that middle ground. Where, where you know you're getting the advantages, but you're not putting yourself at risk. So I think you kind of find that what I'm calling a safety factor here. Um, and then I think you, you really need to, to understand your operational procedures. You know, in, in working with people that, that are running large Cassandra instances in, in my job, um, I, I find that a lot of people test the happy path. They say, "Hey, I'm expecting my production load to be you know X TPS and so many writes and so many reads." And they set up stress tools, and they and they and they make sure that their production load can handle that. You know, their production environment can handle that. And they might even you know do two x testing to see can I handle twice the load. You know, but what a lot of customers don't do is failure testing. So you know, what happens if uh, if I lose a whole data center? Um, you know, what what happens to my my application? Those reads and writes. You know, do, did did my latency spike all of a sudden? Uh, what happens when I start rebuilding the data center from an, from another data center? What happens if I uh, lose a whole rack? You know, what happens to my application, and and how long does it take me to recover? You know, I think that's a big question that a lot of a lot of folks can't answer, and, and and that makes me nervous. Like when you say, you know, what if we lost a node and we had to replace it? You know, especially in this kind of a world where we're using ephemeral drives in the cloud, or we're using uh, containers with you know that, that that aren't on some shared storage we can remount. Um, you know, we, we know that Cassandra has mechanisms in it to help us, um, you, you know, to give us the availability guarantees we want. But uh, does does that come at a latency cost to our application? And you know, it, does it take a week to rebuild the nodes? Or does it take a half a day to rebuild the nodes? So, um, you know, I, I would want to understand those things really well. Have some really well documented procedures. Have a DBA group or a sysadmin group that that really knows uh, how to do that well outside of Docker. And, and then take take those learnings and kind of put Docker into the mix, you know. Um, and uh, along those same lines, to, to me, like when something goes wrong, uh, and you're saying, okay, I got Cassandra in the mix, I got Linux in the mix, I've got some uh, storage mechanism in the mix, and now I've got Docker in the mix, you know. I, 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 you know, do, do my people have visibility into all these layers? Do do people know how to look at the logs at all these layers? Do, can I trace through, you know? And it's just one more uh, area of complexity on top of that. Um, that I think you need you need to make sure you're aware of. So, um, you know, and then I think uh, I heard Ben Bromhead uh, talk earlier about Kubernetes, and uh, uh, Jeff Carpenter just talking in this last talk. He talked about using Kubernetes in a multi-cloud environment. Um, so, you know, Kubernetes to me, uh, uh, you know, sim maybe simplifies some of this, gives you some some um, uh, orchestration on top of containers, but um, to me, to me, it takes away. I don't think it helps that much because, to, to me, the whole benefit of using Kubernetes is that you're saying, okay, I've got these containers. Now I've got Kubernetes on top of that. That, that says, hey, uh, you know, you've got I don't know 50 physical hosts, and I don't want to think about where does this container go, where does this container go. Kubernetes just kind of says, oh, I'm going to move around for you, and and you know, take care of all that for you. But as soon as so, you know, when people talk about running uh, Cassandra in Kubernetes, they always say you're going to use stateful sets. And so that says that state has to live in that pod. So all of a sudden, if you put Kubernetes on top of it, um, the you know you say, okay, I've got I've got state. If I if I lose a container, I still got the state there. But now that that, that container is pinned to that pod. So to me, that that kind of loses a lot of the value of why you did Kubernetes in the first place. So it's a really interesting space. And um, you know, I think I mean, kind of my predictions of what we'll see is we'll we'll see somebody go into production and they'll and they'll and they'll dial that safety factor way back. They'll say. I got this uh, physical host. Uh, it's got 32 um, cores. I'm going to put you know two big containers on it and limit them to use I don't know 16 cores, and, that, and so have a pretty tight safety factor, and start running in that in that kind of a world. Maybe use shared storage so you could remount things, 
And then once you get comfortable with that, then you change one variable. You say, okay, now I'm going to over-provision my server a little bit. I'm going to you know, maybe put three, three containers on there and, and um, you know, let, let them use a little bit more of the elastic uh, resource. And so you know, if, I, if I was going to approach you, if somebody said to me, we, we got to run in, in, in production with Cassandra, Docker, Kubernetes, something like that, but I think that's how I'd approach it. I, I would start off super safe. I would get really comfortable with my operations. Uh, and I would just start adding one thing at a time, you know. So um, I have a couple of slides here with some resources that if you want to look at the, the uh, slides later, you can look at them. But these are some resources that Datastax puts out about um, Docker images. There, there is a, you know, in the demo I pulled down the Cassandra um, uh, image, but there, there are some images that Datastax puts out. Uh, and then here's some, some resources that, that I pulled from in putting this together. So um, I'm not actually sure how long I, I'm going here, but uh, I, think I've, I think I have time for questions. I don't know. Any, any questions? Yeah. How much uh, additional overhead is there running Cassandra in the Docker versus just running it natively? Yeah, you know, I hear people say, if you ask that same question about virtual machines, I hear people say, no, it's like a 10% hit or something. Um, in Docker, they say it's very little, like it's uh, like a Ben Bromhead, somebody asked him that question earlier, he said it's nothing. Um, you know, the, the idea that there's, you know, that they're, they're very quick to spin up, they're like a minimum of resources, it's not like another, it's not another host OS on top of it, it's just, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's C groups and it's namespaces, you know, on your existing thing, so. You know, it seems like there's, you know, maybe one per, saying it's nothing seems like a little, little uh, bold, but I mean, I think it's very, compared to VMs, it's, it's much less, so. Uh, just comment on So just to repeat what you said there, the, the, you're saying that the, the containers are all going to host like one physical NIC, and so some, some of that... Yeah, if you don't use the host networking, then uh, yeah. uh, you will see a performance hit. And yeah. if you do use the host networking, then you will have to allocate the ports yourself, because then uh, the Docker image will be directly using the host network interface. Yeah, okay. So using the Docker's internal bridge-based system. Yeah. Yes, like in this demo, I, I did everything on one physical machine. So if I'd have said, uh, I'm going to have two physical machines that are hosting three, three containers each, then um, you know, you'd, have to, you'd have to use the, a little bit different networking. You have to manually tell each system to use a particular, each image to use a particular port so that it doesn't contact with another instance. Yeah. That's, yeah. All, that's all the problem there is, but it becomes a headache on top of everything else. Yeah. 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 yeah so Do you isolate the disk I/O? Yeah, so uh, I think you do that all through th um, through through C groups. And when you when you say Docker run, um, you know I gave you some com some commands there where um, you know we're, we're setting environment variables. So there's commands here where you can say I'm going to limit the number of CPUs that you can that you can use. You know th this container can only use two and a half CPUs of the 16. And I want to limit the amount of memory that this guy can use. I want to limit the amount of memory that can be swapped to disk. And, and you can also put some constraints on there around disk, disk I/O. So it's it's at a you do it at, at a per uh, per container level. I mean, do you like, question like uh, Yeah, so like in this example, I'm, I'm, I'm taking one, one uh, uh, directory from the local container and I'm mounting it there. Um, so you're asking like, how, how do you control the mounts, like where it's writing? Mounts, I mean to say, like, like you just create one raid, uh, zero, and then just create a folder for different containers, or do you, do you totally like uh, create Yeah, I think you could, uh, well, I mean, 
y you could say I'm going to create some shared storage. You know, I've got this mount point that goes out to my NFS mount or something, and I'm going to assign that each one of those to a container. Or if you or if you had local disks on your host machine and you had like maybe four of them, you could um, yeah you could rate zero of them together and, and let let them all write to one spot. Or you I mean I think there's a lot of ways you can do it. I think it's very flexible. Um, I'm not I'm not sure I know what the answer is in terms of a best practice, but um, yeah yeah sorry. <laughs> um, any other questions? All right well that's. Um, that's what I got. I, I, I'll be at the data stacks booth, um, hanging about, and um, I'm, if anybody's here at, uh, for t tomorrow for Graph Day, I'm doing a talk on uh, data frames and uh, graph frames, and um, so that's some, some some neat stuff. Like I'm looking forward to sharing some of that. So, th thanks for attending.